Hello, my name is Costell and welcome to Brainstorm Interviews. Today we're interviewing a teacher, a teacher that students say is the best teacher in the ICM. Please welcome Louis Damhoff. Thank you. How are you? <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm well, thank yeah. you on this Friday. Uh, it's a bit cold, but uh, it's getting better for the weekend, so I'm doing fine. Yes, Great. Thanks. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Of course. I would like to start uh, by asking something, uh, asking you to tell us something about you. Something about myself. Yes. Um, okay, I've been a teacher for um, I think about nine years now, and uh, I never wanted to become a teacher. I'm uh, I was born and raised in the northern part of the Netherlands, <clears throat> and. Um, um, but after my graduation, after I worked at a publishing company for about four years, I always I wanted to live and start, uh, work abroad for a while. I also studied abroad for in South Africa for about eight months, and uh, but I never knew quite sure. I never knew how to accomplish or how to how to go about it. So uh, I met once I met a friend who I studied with in South Africa who told me he just came back from China to teach mm -hmm. English there, and I thought, okay, well if he can do it, I'm sure I can do it. <laughs> So I didn't really want to become a teacher, but I wanted to work and live in China. So that's where um, that's what I thought. Let's just uh, take the plunge. Um, I left my house, my uh, relationship at the time, and I said I'm I'm leaving. And my friends told me, Great. oh, it's just going to be for a year. But I thought, no, nah, I think it's going to be longer. So and it turned out when I moved there that I loved teaching and I loved being in the classroom. What do you love about it? Um, I think what I like most about it is that you work with young people and that you um, that, that I can work now with with my passion that I talk about uh, intercultural competences about about globalization about world citizenship so it's the, the topic that I <clears throat> that I feel str very strongly and passionate about but I think it's the idea that you leave something behind. You taught in Russia as well? In Moscow, yeah. Okay, how was that? <clears throat> uh, cold. Cold. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was. Uh, <clears throat> no, it was good. It was very different because I was in China. I was living in the uh, southern, southern east, southeastern part of China with a subtropical climate, and um, but I went there for the job because it was a private language institute, and they uh, offered me a really good deal. So I went to Moscow. And I thought it's going to be interesting to live in a metropole. I always wanted to live in a very big city, uh, just for a little bit. But it was it was very interesting. Uh, it was tough because I felt uh, living, um, you know, being uh, well. It's cold, but you, it's kind of reflecting in the in the people as yeah. well. Like walking on the street, not not a lot of people smile. Those yeah, are like stereotypes, you. but it's kind of they've had a hard life, and it kind of it still shows. But at the same time, when the sun breaks through and it becomes spring, that you know all the people wear beautiful dresses, and then it suddenly everybody's it's come to life again. <laughs> and uh, but I really like the Russian people. The, my students were had a fantastic sense of humor, so funny, very self-critical sense of humor, um, so very hospitable. Yeah. Just yeah, what, really. What, really what nice. did you learn? What what is was the main impact on your personality when you got to live in a culture? Uh, so different from uh, your home culture. I think the first lesson that I actually went when I studied in South Africa. So I think that before that I had a pretty black and white view in the world. I would say. Mm. So I thought, okay, this is wrong or this is right, and I kind of knew. But now I know there are fifty shades of gray. <laughs> there are a lot of um, a lot, there's a lot of in between. <coughs> that it's nothing is really right or wrong. There are always different sides to a story. And uh, of course you know that, but you have to experience it. And that's something else that I've learned, I think, that you can learn a lot of things in books and you can read about it, but you have some things you just have to live and you have to experience in order to know, um, yeah, to feel it. You can know things by, by you know, in your head, but you also have to learn it by heart, I think. Okay. So, yeah. So you taught in China, you taught in, Mosul, in Russia. How did you end up studying in the Hansa? Uh, teaching yeah. uh, well, afterwards, I also lived in Los Angeles for oh. a bit, where I wear my another a passion of mine, where I campaigned for Obama. Okay. Like that. So that's politics is another a passion, but it's another um, a field of interest that I have. Uh, I don't know. I had to go back to the Netherlands, and I didn't have a house or a job or anything. I just had my backpack with clothes and a thousand books uh, still stocked at my mom's house. So that's all I had in the whole world. Okay. And uh, so I had to go back to my mom 
<laughs> which is very humbling. <laughs> um, um, and then I thought, what am I going to do here? You know, I've, I have all these years experience teaching English, experience abroad, and what? But then the Hansa called. Actually, a temp agency called me and they said, "Well, there's an opening for one block. Do you mm. want to teach?" And I said, "Sure." So then I um, ended up here teaching English, and I really liked it, and they liked me, so I could stay. And then sooner they said, wait a minute, you have all these experiences, why not move into intercultural competence? So I did. Okay. And that's when I realized, yeah, that's something that I feel very, very, very passionate about, strongly about. And then, yeah, I think one thing led to another, and this is my fourth year, and I have a permanent contract. And, but I'm still, I still, I'm not done traveling abroad yet. Or okay. Moving what are your okay. courses that you teach? Uh, I started off teaching English, but I don't, I, I, I do a couple of classes, maybe one per semester, but not a lot. I teach uh, mostly intercultural competences at communication systems and communication. And I'm also an honors uh, teacher now, so I'm involved in the honors program. The honors program in uh, ICM. Yeah. So for all uh, ICM students, and uh, I also teach an interdisciplinary course, okay. honors course, which is called uh, the Global Village, and um, that's that course is about um, globalization. Okay. And what does it mean to be a member of the global community? And that's one I I'm just finishing up. Interesting. And yeah, very, very. <laughs> so that's that's what I do. And besides that, I'm a, you know I. I Support student internships. I'm an academic counselor. I'm a country coordinator for the VS, for the U.S. and just yeah. all the extra activities that come with teaching that people usually <laughs> don't see. But yeah, it's a lot do of work. Do you have a favorite course that you like? Yeah, the Global Village. The Global Village, yeah. and why is that? Because it allows me because the students are brilliant. Okay. And it allows me to really go into depth about uh, on this topic that I find very interesting. And uh, I te co teach it with an American colleague, uh, mm -hmm. a university in Arlington. So, together, we, there are two classes one in Arlington and one here, but together we have one class. So, they follow the exact same course. They do assignments together, they work together. So, it's, they, we create like kind of a virtual classroom together. So, it's a very, it's like a, a classroom in the cloud, not just okay. Hans or American, but it's in the cloud. Interesting. And that's, I, like the, I like working together with another university, which has taught me a lot. But I really like um, I like the topic globalization a lot. But I think yeah, just um, just exploring yeah, exploring together with students. But I, I particularly like the students a lot. Do you have frequent situations when students surprise you, and how do you? They do in in regular like uh, uh, sophomore classes. They do if they show certain insights, and uh, if they um, even sometimes I think oh that students not really paying attention. But then they come out, they write in their portfolio, in their uh, individual uh, portfolio, for example, things that they share with me, like really personal things that I'm surprised by. Uh, and occasionally that I, especially in the, within uh, the Global Village, that I, that I heard students talk and I thought, wow, they're going to be better than me. They're, they're already <laughs> better than me. And that's for a teacher. Some teachers are, might be afraid of that. And you? No, I'm not. I think it's great. great. I think that if students show me insights or they talk about things, I think, wow. I even I hadn't thought about it, and I think that's uh, that's I think that's very satisfying. About interdisciplinary uh, studies, you have to deal with students that come from different uh, studies. How how do you feel that? How how is it going? Oh, it's do, great. do you feel like you're not uh, uh, able to uh, provide enough information for them, or does it mainly involve? trying to, to get them to share the information. Yeah, it, it, it's challenging because I have IC students and IBS students which are already very well uh, educated in intercultural competence, or they have a lot of experience in yeah. intercultural competences. So they're very well traveled, they're experienced, and you have students of human resources management who don't have that much experience, who feel maybe a little bit insecure about their English, for example, or uh, architecture, or uh, but they uh, somehow uh, I think on uh, somehow on all the different levels they still feel inspired on different ways and they add they bring different things to the table as well so they add different skills to the to the project. Uh, what are your hobbies and in particular about traveling? Because I heard that so much. Uh, from yeah, your yeah. Travel. I've always uh, traveled. To me, traveling is like breathing. So every holiday I'm I'm, I'm traveling. Mm -hmm. And. Um, um, I don't know what I like. I think because uh, I've seen uh, many, many countries, many places. But I, I think a, a traveler, I think a real traveler, can still be still marvel over like small, a small cafe on the street corner, or just sipping tea somewhere, or like uh, beautiful uh, sunset in the Netherlands. So 
Uh, although I've seen spectacular things, I am still I can still be blown away by little things, and so I'm always looking out for the experience. Um, and I realize every time I go to a different country, it will be a great experience, no matter what. Whether I like, maybe like or don't like people or the country that much, or it's different, or it's rainy, or I get sick, it's always an experience. Okay. So yeah, I travel a lot. I also rock climb. Mm. So, but not. Well, I <laughs> climb indoors. That's where I practice, okay. and I have I've rock climbed outside a couple of times, and uh, in France and in Canada. So uh, that's what I do as well, because when I came back to the Netherlands, I really missed the mountains and I thought, what can I do in the Netherlands, <laughs> sport exercise wise, that kind of, mm, that, it, that makes me, yeah, just to do something different that makes, I don't know. So then I realized maybe indoor or rock climbing, indoor climbing is a good, good idea. So I did. And apart from um, traveling, uh, yeah, I think usual. Love to read, but I'm all, yeah interested in politics a lot and anything that has to do with uh, just current affairs, following the news a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and now since I have so many friends across the globe, I try to combine it. Every time I go somewhere, I always try to visit a friend, old uh, colleagues. Would you be willing to share with us a uh, unusual situation that you had <coughs> to be uh, to act in uh, during your traveling? <laughs> Um, well, I've had many. The best uh, one. The <laughs> unusual. Yes. Unusual. Oi, oi, oi. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you're looking for a funny or a scary story, because I have scary stories as well. Let's hear one of those after this uh, one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think the most unusual, I don't know if it's unusual, but the be one of the best experiences that when I was living in China, I had a student and she uh, she really wanted to, she, her English was, was, was not that great, but she really wanted to improve. And she uh, she had a mom, uh, she, she lost a father um, um, uh, to cancer, so, so did I. And she, uh, her mom was working three jobs to, um, to get her to college. Uh, she felt extremely responsible. They lived in a very small uh, house in the countryside, and she came up to me. Her English was, I mean, we could barely communicate, but she invited me to come to her house, and like a lot, a lot of students do. So she invited me, and uh, I knew she was living with her mom and her grandmother, and her grandmother still had those little bound feet, mm. you know, like the women in China uh, in the old days when they still. And her grandmother, she, her grandmother was 93, my grandmother was 93 at the time as well. So uh, although we couldn't really, I mean, my Chinese is not that fantastic and her English wasn't either, but we could uh, communicate and somehow she felt like she was my little sister. And, and I, I gave her a lot of private lessons. I always helped her with her English. And so at one point she wanted to study at a bigger and better university, one of the top 10 in China. Uh, but the, 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 um, uh, the interview, the selection interview was in English. So uh, I worked with her a lot and then she got accepted. And I remember that uh, her family, her mom didn't speak a word of English, but they took me, they took me out and um, they, um, I, I slept in their, their houses. I slept with her in the That's same bed with her mom. Yeah, yeah, so Chinese. it's, it's uh, I mean, they treated me like family and they were so happy that I felt that I was partly responsible. I wasn't, but <coughs> I just helped a little bit. But the after a couple of years, I went back to China. Uh, I visited them again, and now they started their own um, like homework institute. Her mom, they moved to to a, a nicer house, like in the suburbs of the city. And they, her mom now has only has one job instead of three, and she's doing really well. She graduated graduated from university, and and I really see that because I feel so um, close to them that I really see uh, how they've. Uh, yeah, how their living standards have improved, and that's yeah, Interesting. That, that was really really nice. That's and nice yeah, experience. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's I uh, yeah I don't know. and and scary stories. Yeah, I've yeah <laughs> I've been held at knife point uh, in South Africa when I was uh, just arrived um, <laughs> while still feeling uh, thinking very black and white terms like oh you know South Africa still very it was in 1998. Mm. Only four years after apartheid had ended, so it was very, still very much segregated. And uh, I arrived and I thought, I'm going to make everybody friends, you know, I'm going <laughs> to join black and white, and I don't know. So I had these really <laughs> idealistic ideas in my head, and then I arrived in South Africa, and then I walked out of the bus station, and 
I just uh, had changed uh, why I needed to get some money. And still, at that time, we still used traveler checks. <laughs> <laughs> so I walked to the bank, and there were guys standing in front of me with big Uzis. And I thought, oh, this is maybe not the best neighborhood in Johannesburg. Hmm. <laughs> I was very naive. <laughs> So I went inside, got some money, and I walked back to the bus station. And then all of a sudden, six uh, uh, boys surrounded me. And the, the one in front turned around, and he held a knife against my Whoa. throat and said, this is a real South African robbery. I was like, oh, <laughs> OK, a real one. <laughs> so I got really, really scared, and I grabbed my stuff. But I took my small backpack, and um, <clears throat> the um, um, there was just um, my purse. My money was all on my body and underneath my mm. clothes. But my small backpack was uh, an expensive camera in it, some oh. personal stuff, but also a book that my friends had made before I left with personal mm. stories. So they took that as well. And I was so, so scared. And I thought, how am I going to survive this country? You know, and all of a sudden I became like from an ideal back in, into reality. Since we're talking so much about traveling and stuff, I'm really curious to uh, how do you find yourself within nature? What, what do you camp? Do you? Oh, OK, nature, nature. Yeah, nature, I, nature. I think, uh, yeah, I camp a lot. I love camping, yeah. I love trekking. So uh, I, li I like to travel as light as possible. So just preferably just a small backpack. Mm. And uh, camp, staying at people's houses. May I ask uh, like then, you, what, what are the main things that you take in your backpack when you go trekking? Uh, I always wear a big, good pair of boots, uh, flip-flops, pair of shorts, pair of long pants. Good gear, like outside, good warm clothes, a cup, a plate, a spork, okay, spoon fork, <laughs> uh, a camera, contact lenses and glasses. We're getting to the end of the interview and I'm gonna ask you two questions that we're asking every interviewer that we're having. Mm -hmm. And the first question is, uh, tell us a weird thing about yourself. Well, that's not totally a question, but a challenge, let's name it. <laughs> A weird thing about yourself. I think I uh, to relax. I'd like to watch old presidential speeches. Okay. That's I'm a little bit nerdy when it comes to uh, political uh, speeches or politics. So instead of reading or watch, I don't have a TV. Maybe that's weird too. Mm. I don't know. So I never watch TV. I don't know anything about weird TV, but I, um, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit nerdy if it comes to the news or mm -hmm. politics, I suppose. And the second question would be, name please the question that you would never uh, answer on camera. Uh, what I would never answer on camera. I think, I think about like, I would answer personal questions, but, um, I think I would know the line, or I know I think I would know when you cross the line when I come to it. So I can't think of anything. I'm sorry. Thank you for coming. It was a You're pleasure welcome. to talk to you, to get to know you better, and we hope to meet again. Thank, Thank you. you for watching. This was Brainstorm Interviews. Bye bye. Thank you.